Well, thank you. It's uh, a real pleasure being hometown and at the JCC. Um, this place has a special place in the hearts of my wife and I, and that it was in this very building um, that both of our children learned that they were not going to be professional basketball players. <laughs> so the JCC is, is quite meaningful to us. Um, let me start off by telling you about a fantasy I've had with some regularity. Um, it starts off with a team of us overpowering his security guards. Okay, well, it's a fantasy, so why not go whole hog? I single-handedly overpower his security guards. I, I burst into his secret bunker. He grabs for his Luger. I slap it out of his hand, he grabs for a cyanide pill, I knock that out of his hand, he, he comes at me with otherworldly strength, snarling, we grapple, I manage to get him down on the ground, get handcuffs on him, and then get to say, Adolf Hitler, I arrest you for crimes against humanity. So at this point, the, uh, the Medal of Honor version of the fantasy ends, and the viscera start. What would I do if I had Hitler? And if I really allow myself to go there, it's not hard to imagine. Sever his spine at the neck, leaving him paralyzed. Take out his eyes, puncture his eardrums, cut out his tongue, leave him unable to speak, to move, to express, only to feel, inject him with some cancerous thing that's gonna fester in every corner of his body and he spends eternity with, this is what I would wanna have done to Hitler. I've had this fantasy since I was a kid. I still have it now and then. And when I do, my heart beats faster, my breathing speeds up. All these plans for the most evil soul in history, most deserving of punishment. I got a problem with that though, in that I don't believe in souls or evil or punishment. And I think the word wicked only belongs in a musical. But at the same time, there's all sorts of people I'd like to see killed but I'm against the death penalty very firmly. <laughs> but there's all sorts of violent, schlocky movies I like going to, but I'm for very strict gun control, except for this one time at a kid's birthday party, we went to this laser quest place, and I had so much fun hiding in a corner, shooting at people over and over. In other words, um, you're basic confused human when it comes to figuring out the place for aggression in our lives. Now, I don't need to get up on a soapbox here about the problems we have as a species with aggression. We have had poison gas come out of shower heads, anthrax in letters, passenger planes as missiles, mass rape as a military strategy. We are a miserably violent species. But there's some complications with that. The first one being, we don't hate violence, because when it's the right kind, we leap forward to watch it, we hand out medals, we disproportionately vote for, mate with the people who are best at that kind of violence. We don't hate violence, because when it's the right kind, we love it. The other complication is, we are the weirdest species on Earth when it comes to being violent. Okay, we could be like any other chimp out there and like cudgel somebody over the head, and be violent in that way, but we can also do something no more physically taxing than pulling a trigger, or signing an order, or looking the other way, or damning with faint praise, or being passive aggressive. Let me give you an example of one of the weirdest things I've ever heard about human violence. And this had to do with something that occurred in Indonesia in the early 1960s. There was a right-wing coup that brought in a military dictatorship for the next 30 years, and in the aftermath of this, there was a vendetta against every leftist, every atheist, every communist, all the usual. 500,000 Indonesians were killed over the six months after this coup. Right-wing death squads would come and kill every person in a village, the usual. And some decades later, the writer V.S. Naipaul was traveling through Indonesia, and he heard this crazy rumor, which was sometimes when those death squads would come to a village to kill everyone, they would bring along with them a traditional gamelan orchestra. 
One day, Naipaul meets one of these old grizzled veterans of these death squads, and he's some national hero, and talking to him and saying, oh, yes, yes, we got rid of our nation's enemies. We did such a great job. And Naipaul eventually worked up the nerve to say to him, you know, I heard this story that sometimes you guys would bring a gamelan orchestra when you would come to kill everyone. He said, oh, yes, yes, whenever we could, we would bring one along. And Naipaul said, why would you do that? And in one phrase, the man summarized everything that is bizarre about us as a species. He looked puzzled and he said, to make it more beautiful, of course. If we're a species that brings along orchestras to make our genocides more beautiful, we are a very complexly violent species. Now, the biggest complication in making sense of us in terms of violence and aggression is that in addition to us being this miserably violent species, we're this unprecedentedly altruistic and compassionate species. And most of all, we're getting better at it. Look, every single thing on this chart was invented in the last century. You look at Barbara Tuckman's Europe, you look at your Europe in 1800, you look at all the things that are taken for granted, things are getting better. We have this wild puzzle here of, we have the ability to be spectacularly damaging and spectacularly altruistic, and this leaves us with a puzzle. How do we make sense of ourselves as a species? Where do we fit ourselves in, in making sense of our best behaviors and our worst ones? How do we understand the biology of it? Now, one thing that's clear is it's incredibly simple and boring if all you want to explain is the motoric aspects of behavior. Brain tells your spine to tell your muscles to do something or other, and hooray, you've behaved. What's complicated is understanding the meaning of the behavior. Because in one setting, you pull a trigger, and it's an appallingly violent act. In another setting, you pull a trigger and you've suicidally drawn fire on yourself to save somebody else. In one setting, you put your hand on somebody else's and it's an act of profound compassion. In another, it's a first step of a deep betrayal of a loved one. The challenge is understanding the context of our behaviors. And that is one tough biological challenge where the exact same motoric behavior could mean such radically different things. So how do we begin to understand the biology of that? One thing that is clear is you're going to get nowhere if you get in your head that you're going to be able to explain everything with this brain chemical <clears throat> or this gene or this hormone or this childhood experience or this evolutionary mechanism. If you think you're going to explain it all with one of these buckets, you are going to get nowhere at all. Instead, when we see somebody commit one of these behaviors and we ask, why did that behavior occur, we're actually asking a whole hierarchy of questions. What went on in that person's brain one second before that commanded those muscles? What went on in the seconds to minutes before in the environment that triggered those neurons to do that? What went on in the hours to days before hormone levels in the bloodstream that made the brain more or less sensitive to certain stimuli? And then we're often running months worth of neural plasticity back to adolescence, childhood, fetal life, back to your genetic makeup. And from there, it's perfectly pertinent to start asking questions like, so centuries ago, what were your ancestors doing for a living? What sort of cultures did they invent in what sort of ecosystems? And finally, why did that behavior occur? Millions of years worth of questions about why we evolved to be the behaving species that we are. To make sense of it, we have to incorporate all of these. Okay, so giving a quick tour of this approach. Somebody does one of these behaviors, an appalling one, a wonderfully compassionate one, somewhere ambiguously in between, and we ask our biological question, why did that behavior occur? And we start off with one second before, what went on in that person's brain? Now, if we're starting off with appalling behaviors, the first place in the brain you arrive at is the amygdala. The amygdala is about aggression, it's about violence, it's about all of those dark sides. Stimulate the amygdala in a human, a monkey, a rat. You elicit unprovoked aggression, surgically destroy the amygdala, you create an organism who's incapable of aggression. The amygdala and aggression go hand in hand. 
But the really important thing is, if you sit down some amygdalologist and ask them what the amygdala is about, the first word they come up with is not going to be aggression. The first word is going to be fear. The amygdala is about fear, anxiety. The amygdala is what learns for you that don't go there, bad things happen. The amygdala is all about that. What have we just seen? You can't begin to understand the neurobiology without understanding the neurobiology of fear the neurobiology of aggression outside of the context of fear. Now, the way the amygdala processes scary, threatening stimuli is really important. It has a wonderful advantage and a disastrous disadvantage. Okay, so suppose you see something scary and your eyes detect it, and what's the obvious thing, the information goes into your brain, there's this sensory waste station called the thalamus, and it gets sent to your visual cortex. And then your visual cortex starts this science fair project. The first layer of neurons figures out what the dots are. And then the next layer turns those into lines. And then the next layer turns them into shapes and dimensionality. And eventually, four months later, you figure out, oh my, it's a rattlesnake. Perhaps we should let the amygdala know about this. You're long dead under those circumstances. Turns out, at that way station, that switch point, that thalamus, there's a shortcut. And visual information also veers off and heads straight into the amygdala. In other words, your amygdala gets information about a rattlesnake while your visual cortex is still looking for the instruction manuals. In other words, your amygdala can decide it is seeing something scary before you're even conscious of what it is. That could be wonderful. That would be great if we are processing scary stuff on the scale of a tenth of a second, a hundred milliseconds, the amygdala is already getting you into a defensive stance. That's very good evolutionarily, but there's a downside, which is there's a reason why you've got that fancy, complicated cortex grinding away at stuff, because it's accurate. The downside is the amygdala gets visual information, scary information, real fast, faster than your cortex does, but it's not necessarily very accurate. And before you know it, in the right setting with the right sort of person that you're looking at, you decide that the cell phone they're holding is actually a handgun and you pull a trigger. So what do we see here? You can't make sense of the neurobiology of aggression outside of the neurobiology of fear. In a world in which no amygdaloid neuron need be afraid, we'd all be sleeping between lions and lambs. But what's most important is the amygdala gets privileged information all sorts of ways, but the downside is accuracy isn't great and the outcome can be disastrous. Okay, next part of the brain that winds up being relevant. Area called the insular cortex. Take any mammal on Earth and give them some rotten, disgusting, rancid piece of food which they bite into and the insular cortex activates. Tenth of a second, reflex pathways are activated. You gag, you spit the thing out, you throw up, you're nauseous, your eyes flinch. It's a great adaptive mechanism in every mammal out there. It detects poisonous, toxic foods, and it keeps you from swallowing the stuff. The insula detects disgusting, gustatory stimuli. Okay, so take a human and somehow get them to volunteer to do the same thing, and you stick them in a brain scanner and you give them some rancid, horrible thing to bite into, and yes, their insular cortex activates as well. Now, don't give them something rancid and disgusting to taste, just make them think about it. Think about that struggling little insect and its legs pushing against your lips as you push it down, and you're gonna activate your insular cortex. Oh, in humans, not only does it mediate gustatory disgust, it mediates us imagining, imagining disgusting things that are gustatory. But now take the person, don't give them something disgusting to eat, don't make them think about eating something disgusting, make them think about something else. And what you'll see is the insular cortex activates. The insula in us also mediates moral disgust. In other words, the same part of the brain that tells you this is toxic, rancid food is the part that also tells you this is a moral transgression that is so severe, I feel sick to my stomach. I feel queasy. 
and leaves a bad taste in my mouth. So this is great. This is actually very adaptive because if a moral transgression was just some cerebral abstraction, it would take a lot of motivation to get up and actually try to right that wrong. If your stomach is lurching, that's the fuel that we get, the viscera, to try to go and do something about it. So that's great. But there's a downside, which is obviously one person's morally disgusting way of behaving is somebody else's perfectly normal loving lifestyle. Moral disgust is a moving target. And the danger is for somebody to decide that a sense of disgust is a good litmus test for whether something is right or not, because what that's going to do every single time is bias you towards deciding them and their really different ways in which they behave that's so different it's got to be wrong, wrong, wrong. I can't tell you why, but it's just wrong when they do stuff. So what we see here is, in every animal out there, the insula is about sensory disgust, gustatory, and us. It can also do moral disgust. And what's most important there is, it's that moving target. And the insula is the pathway by which we decide, just because they're different, it's got to be something that's deeply wrong. And no surprise, the first part of the brain the insula talks to is the amygdala. Okay, balancing it a bit, we bring in the next brain region called the frontal cortex. It is spectacular. It's the most recently evolved part of our brain. We've got more of it than any species out there. The frontal cortex, here's what it does in a nutshell. The frontal cortex makes you do the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Long-term planning, gratification postponement, impulse control, emotional regulation. Every time you have a mammal in a situation like this, where it's not grabbing the cookie, that frontal cortex is working like mad, doing the thing that's harder but better. Now, the whole thing about the frontal cortex is very easy to view its job is mostly it sends projections down to the amygdala, and its job is to muffle the amygdala before it goes and does something stupid and disastrous. Like, basically, it's this picture of top-down regulation. The only thing that the frontal cortex cares about with the amygdala is to show up there now and then and preach like Christian temperance or something, and otherwise is up there in the lofty heights. It turns out, though, that it's not just the frontal cortex cortex talking to the amygdala, it's at least as powerfully the case of the amygdala talking to the frontal cortex. And what's that about? That's the world in which in a highly aroused, highly stressed state, you decide to do something which seems brilliant at the time and you regret for the rest of your life. Judgment goes down the tubes when the amygdala is running the frontal cortex rather than the other way around. Now, the fact that the frontal cortex is being marinated in all these emotional inputs from down below begins to explain just how varied, just how heterogeneous the tasks for the frontal cortex are. All of these require you to have a frontal cortex that works well. Think about this. You were tempted to lie about something for some sort of gain. And your frontal cortex is the thing that's going to be working like crazy if you are going to resist that temptation. However, once you decide you are going to lie, you need a frontal cortex to lie effectively. You need a frontal cortex to make sure you make the right amount of eye contact and control your facial expressions and don't let your throat, your voice crack. If this is a part of the brain that is central to both avoiding temptation and then once you succumb to it, doing a good job at it, this is a very complex brain region. So what we see here about the frontal cortex is it makes you do the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. The right thing, critically, is a value-free judgment. And what you see is this is not a picture of this is this like Olympian cerebral area up there. It's sitting there just soaking in your emotions and hormones and all of that. We do not make decisions in a purely cognitive way. Okay, next brain region, a region having to do with a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine is about pleasure. Cocaine works on the dopamine system, a particular part called the mesolimbic, mesocortical dopamine system. Cocaine is about pleasure because it works on dopamine pathways. Okay, and as you see here, 
take a human, take a monkey, take a rat, and unexpectedly they get a reward from out of nowhere, and the system activates, the dopamine neurons get all excited. Now do something a little bit different. Now instead of just giving a reward from out of nowhere, what you do is, whoa, what just happened? I just pushed a button here. Okay, what you do now is you train that individual. A light comes on, a signal comes on in the room, and that means if you now go and work, press a lever 10 times, you're going to get a reward. Signal, do the work, get the reward. Under those conditions, when does dopamine rise? Not when you get the reward, right there, when the signal comes on. What's that? That's this is going to be great. I am all over this. I know how that lever stuff works. I know the rules here. This is going to be fabulous. What we see here is dopamine is not so much about reward as it's about the anticipation of reward. And most remarkably, if you block that rise from dopamine, they don't press the lever. Dopamine is also about the motivation, the goal-directed behavior to do what's needed to get that reward. Now, one more wrinkle about dopamine. What I've shown you here is a circumstance where you do the work, you get the reward. 100% predictability. Shift things now so that only about 50% of the time you do the work and you get the reward. What happens to dopamine then? It goes through the roof like nothing you've ever seen. What have we just done here? We've introduced something very important into our neurochemistry. We've introduced the word maybe. And nothing fuels us like the word maybe. Maybe is that fulcrum of this is going to be great, but I'm such a loser, but I've got my lucky socks on today, but I'm going to screw up again, and maybe yes, maybe no. And we teeter on that fulcrum, and that uncertainty of maybe pumps motivated behavior out of us like nothing on earth. And this is something that the neurobiologist who invented Las Vegas understood from day one. <laughs> Intermittency is an enormous force in the system. So we see dopamine is about reward, even more so it's about the anticipation of reward, even more so it's about the goal-directed behaviors you are motivated to do to get that reward. And we see that nothing motivates the system more than inserting maybe uncertainty, intermittency into the system there. And what is fascinating, and we will get to, is there are few things out there that more reliably activate this dopamine system than somebody getting to righteously punish somebody else. Okay, a couple more brain regions. One area called the fusiform cortex, it's a primate specialty, it recognizes faces. Another region called the anterior cingulate, it's got something to do with empathy. Poke your finger with a pin, and the anterior cingulate is one of the parts of the brain that activates. Poke the finger of your loved one with a pin, and your anterior cingulate activates. It's the part of the brain that feels somebody else's pain. Okay, so fusiform cortex does facial recognition, anterior cingulate does empathy. But then it turns out there's fine print. Look at somebody's face, and if it's the face of somebody of a different race, on the average, the fusiform doesn't activate as much. It doesn't register it as much as a face, and you remember it less accurately. Show somebody a film clip of somebody's hand being poked with a needle, and the anterior cingulate activates, but if the person's skin is a different color from yours, there isn't as much activation. So it depends whose face, whose pain, it all depends on those cases. Okay, so we've gotten a sense now of what's going on in the brain one second before. But no brain is an island, so we return to our scenario. One of our behaviors occurred, it's appalling, it's wonderful, it's in between. And now we ask the why did that behavior occur question, stepping further back. What went on in the seconds to minutes before sensory stimuli that caused that amygdala to do whatever, that caused that frontal cortex, that inhibited that insula, what in our sensory worlds are stimulating some of these neural responses? And what's most striking there is, amid the obvious stuff, yes, if you see somebody coming at you with a knife, the visual information there could sure get your amygdala going. What is most interesting is sensory information is streaming into us all the time, and we haven't a clue what it's doing to our behavior. Some examples here. Center, put up a pair of eyes like that on a poster on a bus stop 
and people litter less. Have those eyes flash up on a computer screen and people cheat less when they're playing an online game. Flash it up for a tenth of a second on the screen below subliminal detection. You're not even sure what you saw and people become more honest in their play. Okay, how about this one? Far left, give somebody something like cod liver oil, a spoonful, something that tastes totally disgusting, and in the minutes afterward, they are more condemning of a moral transgression and advocate a more severe punishment because you got a bad taste in your mouth. Next example, on the bottom there. Person sits either in the hard wooden chair or the nice cushy sofa and they read what are supposedly resumes of job applicants and they evaluate them afterward. Sit in a hard wooden chair and you are more likely to assess somebody as having a rigid, inflexible personality. <laughs> this is for real. This is you sit in a chair like that and you're more likely to perceive somebody as being a hard ass. This is totally wild. One of my favorite examples on the right here, put somebody in a room and let them fill out a questionnaire about their political views. Social views, economic, geopolitical. Put somebody in a room with smelly garbage and they become more socially conservative. Doesn't do a thing to your economic or geopolitical views. You're sitting there and subliminally something's feeling disgusting, something's feeling disgusting, and you're more likely to decide, oh, when those people do that, that is not okay. I am not good with that. You shift people that way. More examples. Top right, this is a study that should give any one major pause. This came out in a very prestigious journal a few years ago, and it looked at the parole board system in Israel. It happened to be Israeli scientists, and they looked at, over the course of a year, the 5,000 parole decisions that were made by judges there, whether to grant somebody freedom or send them back to jail. And what they showed was, over the course of those thousands of judgments, the single best predictor of whether a judge would grant parole or not was how many hours it had been since the judge had eaten a meal. If you came before a judge right after a meal, 60% chance of being paroled right before a meal, you're down there to zero or so. And what's remarkable about this is two things. The first one is we understand the biology of this. Blood sugar levels have something to do with how well your frontal cortex works. What's the frontal cortex have to do with it? Making you do the harder thing of thinking about somebody else's mitigating circumstances and what the world has been like for them. Low blood sugar and it's it's much easier to say, screw it, send them back to jail. The second remarkable thing about that is if you took any of those judges one half second after they made that decision and said, oh, so why do you send that guy back to jail but this guy got parole? And they would quote freshman philosophers to you. They would never in a million years say, because of my blood sugar levels and the metabolic rate in my frontal cortex. Finally, top left, one of the most disturbing findings, depressing as hell in this entire field, take people, stick them in a brain scanner, and flash up pictures of faces. Flash them up for a tenth of a second, you're barely even sure what you're seeing, and flash up a picture of a face of another race from yours, and in the average person, the amygdala activates. The amygdala activates in 80 milliseconds, 80 thousandths of a second. Oh my God, we are hardwired to be racist and all those things. This is incredibly depressing, well-replicated finding. But now do the study a little bit differently. I recently found out that San Francisco has a baseball team, and apparently there's a team in Los Angeles that it doesn't get along with well. So now what you do is the same study with San Franciscans who are baseball fans. You're flashing up faces, and they're wearing baseball caps, either for the Giants or the Dodgers, and flash up a face, and it doesn't matter what the skin color is, if it's a Dodgers hat for a tenth of a second, the amygdala activates. Whoa, we are innately wired for racism. This thing invented in the 19th century, baseball and baseball fandom and all of that, in milliseconds completely overrides it because we have a completely different category then of who is an us and who is a them just from a brief visual cue. 
Okay, so in those seconds to minutes before, we are seeing we are just being pummeled nonstop by all sorts of sensory inputs we're not even aware of, we would never guess are being relevant, and often ones that we don't even know are there, subliminal. Okay, so now we push further back. We've seen our appalling act, our wonderful act in between, and we asked why did this behavior occur? What occurred in the hours to days before that made that organism more or less sensitive to that bad smell, that particular sight, whatever, and thus made the amygdala, the frontal cortex, etc., more or less likely to do whatever? What do hormones have to do with it? So if we're talking about violent human behavior, you know right off the bat, we're going to have to start off with testosterone. What's the deal with testosterone? Why is it that testosterone is at the centerpiece of the fact that in every culture on earth and in virtually every species out there, males are such a pain in the rear when it comes to violence? Testosterone causes aggression. Turns out that's not remotely what testosterone does. Let me show you an example of this. Okay, so here we have five male rhesus monkeys. You put them together and they form a dominance hierarchy. A defeats B three times, B never defeats A, A is highest ranking, B next, you get a dominance hierarchy like that. Now take C in the middle there. Shoot C up with testosterone. Give C so much testosterone that like every neuron in his amygdala is growing antlers, tons of testosterone. Is C now going to get involved in more fights? Absolutely. Is this what occurs? Is suddenly C challenging A and challenging B and rising the hierarchy? Not in the slightest. What happens instead is C becomes a total nightmare to D and E. Testosterone doesn't invent new patterns of aggression. Testosterone amplifies the pre-existing social learning you have about aggression. Testosterone lowers the threshold for external stimuli to trigger it. So that's a very different picture of testosterone's actions. But it turns out it does something even more subtle than that. And this is some wonderful work done by John Wingfield, UC Davis, in what's called the challenge hypothesis. It turns out testosterone doesn't so much affect aggression. What testosterone does is when you're being challenged, it makes you do whatever behavior you need to hold on to your status. Now, if you're a baboon, when you're being challenged, you hold on to your status by being violent. Aggression and challenged status is synonymous. But humans, humans are different because you can put humans in a situation where you get status by being generous. For example, in a certain economic game where you get brownie points by giving larger offers in economic exchanges and remarkably give people testosterone and they become more generous when they're playing that game. In other words, if you took a thousand Buddhist monks and shot them up with testosterone, they would run amok doing random acts of kindness. <laughs> the whole point there is, it's not that testosterone makes us aggressive, it's that we hand out status for aggression so readily. Now, if we're thinking about our best behaviors and we're thinking hormones, immediately we have to hurdle into the greatest hormone on earth when it comes to this endocrine jargon, what's officially the grooviest hormone on earth, oxytocin. Oxytocin promotes mother-infant bonding. Oxytocin in monogamous species promotes the formation of pair bonds. Oxytocin makes us more trusting. It makes us more expressive. Amazingly, showing what evolution has done in the last 20,000 years, when you and your beloved dog stare in each other's eyes, you both secrete oxytocin. And if they inject the dog with oxytocin, the dog's going to stare at you longer, boosting your oxytocin levels up for oxytocin. It's about trust. It's about expressivity. Give fruit flies oxytocin and they sing like Joan Baez. It's the most wonderful hormone on earth. So oxytocin is pro-social. It promotes pro-social behavior. Turns out oxytocin does no such thing. 
One example of this, this was work that came out of the Netherlands a few years ago, and what they did in that study was they gave subjects classic problem in philosophy, the runaway trolley problem. Trolley is running down tracks out of control, it's about to hit and kill five people. Is it okay to push one person onto the track? They'll get killed, but they'll stop the trolley. It's okay to kill one to save five. Classic problem in utilitarian philosophy, and you get totally different answers depending on how you phrase it. People People make whole living studying the trolleyology problem with moral philosophy. So here's what they did. They got a bunch of volunteers and they gave them the runaway trolley problem. And would you push this person onto the track? And they gave a name to the person being pushed on the track. Third of the time, it was somebody with apparently just a standard good old boy Dutch name like Dirk or Peter or something. And the rest, it was from the two groups that have consistent negative aversive connotations for people in Holland. Germans, oh yeah, World War II, forgot about that, and people who were Muslim. And now you give somebody a choice. Do you push Dirk in front of the trolley? Do you push Otto? Do you push Mahmoud? And what you see is give somebody oxytocin, a Dutch person, and they're less likely to want to push Dirk onto the track, and they're much more likely to do an Ahmed or Otto. What do we see here? Oxytocin doesn't make us more pro-social. It makes us more pro-social to people who count as us's. It makes us crappier and more preemptively xenophobic to thems. It takes that fault line in our heads between us's and thems and exaggerates it. Okay, so we look at these hormones and what we see is our endocrine systems are affecting our brains, our sensory systems all the time. We're being marinated it. And when it comes to testosterone, the critical thing there isn't that it causes or even potentiates aggression. The cause of our Earth's miseries is that we reward aggression so readily. When it comes to oxytocin, the punchline there is it's wonderfully pro-social for people like us. And for them, it does just the opposite. Okay, pushing further back our wonderful, our terrible, our in-between behavior. Why did that behavior occur? What did events in your brain in the weeks to months before have to do with it? And this is this whole new trendy world of neuroplasticity. Your brain changes in response to experience. You will see, depending on the experience, you grow new connections between neurons. You shrivel up other ones. Neurons form new processes, other ones. That you make new neurons, you kill neurons. The making one up on the top left is the biggest revolution in neuroscience in the last quarter century. The adult brain makes new neurons One's in green there and a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Your brain changes in response to experience. That's so exciting. There's hundreds of thousands of neuroscientists out there spending their careers studying neuroplasticity and they're naming their kids neuroplasticity. But we see a downside here. We see this wonderful potential for the brain to change itself. What you see, though, is no matter how many rounds of 10,000 hours of practice you do evoking neuroplasticity, none of us are going to be Yo-Yo Ma or LeBron James. None of us with a severed spine are going to be able neuroplasticity our way into a reconnected one. There's definite limits as to how far it could go. Even more importantly, neuroplasticity is a value-free concept. And sometimes your brain could be neurally plastic and as a result, you get much better at being a saint and some of the time you get much better at being an ethnic cleanser. It's independent of moral value. Okay, so now we push further back. Good behavior, bad behavior in between. What went on in your adolescence having something to do with now whether you were going to pull that trigger in that moment? What about adolescence? And it turns out all of adolescent behavior is explained by two key facts. The one is by the time you're about 12 years old, your dopamine system is going full blast. The other fact is your frontal cortex isn't fully online when you're a teenager. It doesn't fully mature until, get this, until you're about 25 years old. In other words, teenagers are running around with frontal cortexes that are running on like two cylinders or so and dopamine systems that are completely out of control. And what's this? This is why teenagers are sensation seekers and novelty seeking and are so appallingly violent 
violent and so incredibly self-sacrificial and join cults and found religions and give away their life savings and change. And this is, this is why teenagers are teenagers, because this dopamine system is a gyroscope without a frontal cortex putting its hand on now and then to keep things balanced. So that explains a lot about teenage behavior. What it also explains is a lot about us in our adult state. Because what that means is late adolescence, early adulthood is when experience is generating the frontal cortex you're going to have as an adult. And that has a critical implication. If the frontal cortex is the last part of your brain to mature, by definition, it's the part of your brain least influenced by genes and most shaped by environment and experience. And almost certainly, it had to evolve that way. Okay, you put your visual cortex together in about three years, 25 years for your frontal cortex. Is it fancier neurons there? Is that a tougher construction project? No, it's exactly the same. Why the 25-year delay? We've been selected for that because that's how our frontal cortex learns all the really subtle social rules. Don't kill but it's good to kill them. You don't lie, but here's a circumstance where you lie. Hypocrisy, rationalization, why I'm an exception, those don't come by the time you're three years old. That takes a quarter century to even begin to wire that up properly. That's why frontal maturation is so delayed. Okay, pushing further back now, good, bad, in between, what about what happened in your childhood? What happened in your fetal life that produced the adult brain, endocrine system, etc., that's now deciding whether or not to pull that trigger? Now, what is clear is something that used to not be clear, which is childhood matters. And the type of childhood you have is utterly shaping of the sort of adult you have coming out the other end, obviously. What has been revolutionary, though, in recent years is beginning to understand the nuts and bolts biology of how early experience in life sets your brain for being different forever after, your hormonal system, etc. a trendy, wildly trendy new field called epigenetics. Epigenetics, the notion that you have your genes, your DNA sequence from birth, but what experience does, especially early in life, is make it easier or harder to cert turn certain genes on or off. What epigenetics is about is the way in which experience leaves an imprint on your DNA. So what does this look like? Here's one example of this. It turns out, bizarrely enough, the world is filled with mother rats, some of whom are wonderful and some of whom who are not great mothers. Okay, what counts as a good mother rat? She licks her pups a lot. She grooms them. She picks them up, carries around a lot. This is great rat mothering. And something that was first shown in the early 60s was if you lucked out and as an infant rat, you had one of those highly attentive good mothers as an adult, you would have lower levels of stress hormones in your bloodstream. As a result, you had an epigenetic change in one part of your brain, and as a result, less stress hormone levels. So now you have this epigenetically shaped by early life experience brain on your hands. You're an adult rat now, and you've just had your baby. And if you have lower stress hormone levels, you're more likely to be a mother who grooms and licks her pups a lot. And thus you pass on that trait to the next generation, not passing on to the genes, what's now called non-genetic, non-genomic transmission of traits, multi-generational early life experience changes adults in a way that replicates the mothering pattern and passed on. Remarkably, the same thing can occur when you're a fetus. If you are a fetus and you have the bad luck that your mother is stressed like mad during the pregnancy, and thus you are exposed to high levels of stress hormones as a fetus, as an adult, you're gonna have a bigger amygdala, which is gonna be more reactive to threat and generate higher stress hormone levels. And thus, when you're pregnant, your fetus is going to be exposed to higher stress hormone levels and passed on multi-generationally.
Okay, so what do we see here? Obviously, early environment, beginning in fetal life, sculpts your brain, sculpts your endocrine systems, and these epigenetic changes, in some cases, can be lifelong. Most remarkably, in some cases, they can even be multi-generational, and where epigenetics is most dynamic is during fetal life. Environment does not begin at birth. Okay, so now we push further back. How about back to our good, bad, in-between behavior? How about back when you were nothing more than a fertilized egg, when you were just your genes? What do genes have to do with it? And there's no field I'm in talking about this evening that is more contentious, more ripe for misinterpretation, ideology, all of that, than what genes have to do with behavior. And this isn't surprising that there's a lot of people out there who are fervently taken with the deterministic power of genes. Because we've sequenced the human genome and we spent more money on that than any life science project out there. And DNA, it's the holy grail, it's the code of codes that determines everything. Your DNA tells every cell in your body what to do. Your genes have no idea what they're doing. Your genes no more decide what your cells, what your organs, what your body does, no more decides than the recipe on a cake box decides when you make the cake. It's just the instructions. What actually is regulating genes? The environment. The environment is what determines when your genes are turned on and off. Now, some of the time on the top there, environment could be very boring, your cellular environment. Some cell is running out of energy, and as a result, a gene is turned on, which makes more of a thing called a glucose transporter. And thus, the cell takes up more glucose, more energy. So a cellular environment that's energy poor turns on an appropriate gene, and you fix the problem. Sometimes environment can be your whole body. Suppose, for example, you're being exposed to higher levels of testosterone, and as a result, in some muscle cell, genes are turned on, and the cell grows bigger. You put on muscle mass from testosterone. And some of the time, environment can be environment in the conventional sense, the world out there. You give birth, and you smell your child for the first time, and you are going to turn on genes in your hypothalamus having to do with oxytocin. Oh my God, genes determine everything that happens in your body. That's ridiculous. You smell a baby's tush and you change gene transcription. Genes are determining nothing. Genes are controlled by environment. And the critical thing is the same gene functions in different ways in different environments. Do not dare write down anything on this table here, but what we have here is a list of some of everybody's favorite genes that have something to do with behavior, where in each case they have an effect on behavior only in a certain environment. And the example that's probably most pertinent to us is the one in red. It's got to do with the gene called MAO-alpha, monoamine oxidase alpha. Turns out it comes in a couple of different flavors. And if you have one flavor in rats, in lab monkeys, all of that, you are more prone towards impulsive aggression. So what about in humans? What if you've got that version of the MAO-alpha gene? Is that associated with more aggression and antisocial behavior? Absolutely if and only if you were abused as a child. No child abuse, doesn't matter what version you have. What we see here is the gene does something, but it's dependent on the environment. It's useless to ask what one does outside the context of the other. So genes decide nothing. Instead, the environment is regulating what your genes do. And what we see above all else is interactions between gene and environment so that after a while it winds up being meaningless to ask what does this gene do it only works to ask what does this gene do in a particular environment now in theory that could be very exciting but nonetheless there's not a whole lot of penguins living in the gobi desert so like they all live in the same environment but but us we live in rainforests and desert and tundra and cities and hamlets and socialist societies and capitalist ones and monogamous and polygamous. There's no species on earth that lives in more varied environments. In other words, there's no species on earth that is more freed from the deterministic powers of genes. Okay, so that takes us all the way back to being a fertilized egg. 
But remarkably, we got to push further back and making sense of those behaviors. What were your ancestors up to? What sort of cultures did they evolve and what sort of ecosystems? Because that's going to have something to do with how you grew up. What you see is there's certain patterns that go along with certain types of ecosystems, certain types of cultures that get invented. For example, a statistically consistent finding throughout this planet, desert dwellers are more likely to invent monotheistic religions. Rainforest dwellers are more likely to invent polytheistic ones. And what we see is a whole bunch of other traits that go along with it having something to do with why warfare is far more common amongst desert pastoralists than among rainforest hunter-gatherers. You see other things as well. Different community sizes produce different types of religions. Study hunter-gatherers and small bands like that, and hunter-gatherers, the gods they invent, could care less what humans are doing. The gods there are all off to like elk hunt or whatever it is. Hunter-gatherers do not invent gods that have any interest in humans. It's not until you start seeing people living in permanent settlements at higher density, it's not until people are living in high enough of densities that they interact with strangers and they interact anonymously that people start inventing moralizing gods. Gods who are keeping track of what you're doing and knows whether you've been naughty or nice and reward or punish based on that. You don't start inventing gods who police human behavior until you're big enough that you interact anonymously with strangers. Another classic distinction here, which is how are your ancestors making a living? And traditionally, there were three different ways of doing it. You could be a hunter-gatherer top left, you could be an agriculturalist or a horticulturalist, or you could be this relatively rare state of being a pastoralist. People wandering the grasslands, the deserts, with their cows, their camels, their goats. And it turns out if you're a pastoralist, there's a very certain type of vulnerability there. Nobody, no matter how bad and mean they are, can show up in your rainforest and steal your rainforest overnight. It's hard for people to show up and steal all 20 acres of your planted crops there that haven't popped up yet, but people can come at night and rustle your cattle, can steal your camels. Pastoralists are vulnerable to losing their livestock, and every pastoralist culture on earth comes up with what is termed a culture of honor built around great hospitality to the stranger who is a tra traveler, enormously violent retribution for any norm violations. This is the world of warrior classes and clan vendettas and feuds that go on for centuries and cultures of honor produce very distinctive types of horrific violence. Okay, so culture. Different ecosystems produce different cultures, produce different types of behaviors. What is remarkable is, for example, suppose one of the biggest distinctions out there culturally between what are called individualistic cultures, the U.S. is the poster child of it, or collectivist cultures, typically East Asian. And what you see is, if you were born into one of those cultures, within a minute of life, on the average, mothers in individualistic cultures are talking to their babies more loudly than those in collectivist cultures. They're holding them for less time. They're waiting less time to pick up a baby when they're crying. This baby will be sleeping alone on the average earlier. The, from the first minutes of your life, culture is leaving an imprint on who you are. And thus what we see is brains and genes and cultures co-evolve. So what this brings us to now is our final category, going all the way back, because if we're talking about genes, we've got to talk about the evolution of genes. What went into the millions of years of evolution that produced us into the sort of species we are making this decision whether or not to pull that trigger? Now, modern evolutionary biology and thinking about behavior, the evolution of behavior has three building blocks, three foundational notions. The first one is called individual selection. Animals behave in order to leave as many copies of their genes in the next generation as possible. 
what is called the selfish gene concept, individual selection. Animals, including humans, try to maximize reproductive success. And what we see here is a great example of this in humans. Currently, 16 million people on this planet are direct descendants of Genghis Khan the most reproductively successful human on Earth. And we all know the worlds of powerful men with multiple wives and polygamous societies and many kids, lots of individual selection. Second building block, sometimes a way to pass on more copies of your genes is to reproduce a lot. Sometimes a better way is to help your relatives reproduce a lot, something called kin selection, which winds up being a function of how related you are, producing this famous quip, I'd gladly lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. Because if you help a full sibling reproduce twice, that has the same evolutionary impact as you reproducing one time. Okay, so animals are driven by kin selection, cooperation among relatives, things of that sort. And humans show the exact same thing. We've developed kin selection in a way that makes any other primate green with envy. We've invented material culture, and then we've invented this phenomenon of passing it on to our descendants, inheriting wealth. That is kin selection out the wazoo. Finally, third building block, reciprocal altruism. In some settings, it makes sense to cooperate with individuals, even if they aren't related to you, as long as these are stable, symmetrical, reciprocal relationships. And what's that about? That's the whole economic world. So what we see here is, Human behavior is completely explained by these building blocks of evolutionary biology, individual selection, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism. Until you look more closely. <laughs> individual selection, you maximize passing on copies of your own genes. But then you have human religions where people don't reproduce, where they're celibate, like the Shakers. Kin selection, you maximize the passing on of copies of genes of those who share lots of genes with you, and then you have blended families adopting children from the other side of the planet. Reciprocal altruism, we are altruistic to somebody with the expectation that is done in return, and then we do something that is unprecedented. You are in a city on the other side of the planet, you're going to the airport, you're about to fly from there, you are never gonna see a person there again, there's no chance for reciprocity, but nevertheless, as you enter the terminal, you pause for a second to hold the door open for someone. There is no evolutionarily biologically informed chimp who could make any sense of the fact that we do that. So what we see here is evolution of behavior is built around individual selection, kin selection, reciprocal altruism, which explains a ton about human behavior until you more, look more closely. Okay, so what have we gotten to here? We see, we ask, why did that behavior occur? And we're asking questions about neurobiology of one second before to genetics, culture, prenatal, all the way to millions of years of evolution. What we've managed to arrive at here this long into this lecture is the in conclusion that it's complicated. Oh, great, I had to sit for 50 minutes through that to hear it's complicated. Let's try to make this a little bit more useful. It's complicated, so be damn sure you understand how things really work before you decide that you do and go and judge somebody, especially if you're judging them harshly. Now, for me, the single most important thing about all of these biology factoids I just downloaded on you is every single one of them can change. Every single one of them can change over time, change with experience, and potentially with enormous consequences. Ecosystems change. This is a rock carving of a hippo in the middle of the Sahara, where 2,000 years ago this was lush grassland. Ecosystems change. Cultures change. In the 18th century, the scariest people in all of Europe were the Swedes. They spent the entire century rampaging through Europe, and then something changed. And these days, this is what the Swedish military spends its time doing. They haven't had a war in more than a century. Cultures change. Most importantly, people change. Neurons grow new connections. Others, parts of the brain get bigger, parts get smaller, and we show ourselves capable of extraordinary change. Let me spend the last couple of minutes here showing some incredibly powerful examples of it. 
First one, John Newton. This was a British theologian who played a central role in the abolitionist movement, the abolishment of slavery from the British Empire in the early 1800s. Remarkably, this he accomplished in his old age. Remarkably, as a young man, he worked as the captain of a slave ship for years and years. And most remarkably, after he got a little bit tired of the sea and retired, he invested in the slave trade. And 34 years after he retired from investing in slavery, he wrote his first pamphlet opposing slavery and became the moral titan of abolition in the British Empire. Something changed. Something changed in this theologian, which he celebrated in a hymn that he wrote that he is most famous for, the hymn Amazing Grace. Next example, this man on the left, Zenji Abe, this is the morning of December 6th, 1941, where he was the lead pilot on a bomber squadron that has hacked Pearl Harbor. And this is the same man 50 years to the day where as an old man, he came to a survivor ceremony in Honolulu at Pearl Harbor, came up to these elderly men who had survived his attack and he apologized to them. And he and some of these men, as pictured there, spent the rest of their lives in close touch. That could change also. Change thus can occur over the course of decades. Sometimes change can occur over the course of hours or days. One of the most moving events in World War I was the famed Christmas truce of 1914. December 1914, the first Christmas of the war, various powers that be, including the Pope, decided Christmas Eve afternoon, there was gonna be a three hour ceasefire up and down the trenches of France and Belgium so that men could come out and retrieve their dead from no man's land. So at the appointed time, the gun stopped firing and people came out and retrieved their dead. And then after a while, they started helping the guys on the other side carry their dead. And then they started helping each other dig graves in the frozen ground. And then they prayed together at the ceremonies, at the burial ceremonies. And before it was over with, German and British soldiers shared Christmas dinner, they exchanged gifts, they sang songs, they prayed together. The next day as documented up and down the trench lines of Europe, they played football together and they didn't keep score and they didn't care who was on which side and they exchanged gifts and they exchanged addresses so they could visit each other after the damn war was over with and they made agreements with each other to shoot over each other's heads. And it lasted for days at some of these places and it took the officers showing up and threatening to shoot these men to get them to go back to trying to kill each other. In other words, a whole lifetime of propaganda, a whole lifetime of nationalism, whatever military training of us and them, and all it took was a couple of hours to completely redefine who was an us and who was a them, us being us, all of us, stuck in this hell of trench warfare, and them being any bloated officer in the back line who would have us killed for their advantage. And some of the time, extraordinary change can happen over the course of minutes. Probably the single most traumatic event in terms of turning America against the Vietnam War was the My Lai Massacre. 1968, an American brigade went into a village filled with unarmed civilians, predominantly elderly people, women and children, and before it was over with, had killed 350 to 500 civilians mutilating bodies, gang rapes before killing people, killing the livestock, burning the fields. This was appalling because it happened, because the US government hid it for a year, because when it finally had to confront it, it handed out a slap on the wrist only to the commanding officer, and because it almost certainly wasn't the only time this occurred. This man on the right, a man named Hugh Thompson, this is the man who stopped the My Lai massacre. He was flying a helicopter gunship. He had heard word that they were shooting in this Milai village. He flew over there, assumed he would see American troops defending the village against Viet Cong, landed, got out, and saw American soldiers shooting old women in the head. 
pulling babies out from underneath the bodies of their mothers to decapitate them, looked at this, realized what was happening, and what he did was, in an instant, all of his training evaporated as to who was an us and who was a them. There was the last group of surviving civilians over there and a group of American soldiers coming at them, and he landed his helicopter between the two and pointed his machine guns at his fellow American soldiers and said, I will mow you down if you you do not stop. And what's most remarkable about each one of these men and each one of these transformations is they've got the same neurotransmitters we do and the same sort of neural wiring and the same endocrine glands and the same gene regulation. There's nothing different about them from us. They put their pants on one leg at a time. And what we're left with here at the end is bringing out that inevitable George Santayana cliche, those who don't study history are destined to repeat it. What we have here is an inversion of this. Those who don't study the history of extraordinary human change and who don't study the science of what circumstances make those more likely to occur are destined not to be able to repeat moments of incandescent change of that sort. So, on that note, good luck with your own best and worst behaviors, and thank you. time for a few questions. If you can stay, if you need to take off, please do. I'm over here. So okay. my question is, when babies are born drug and alcohol exposed and had exposure through the whole 40 weeks of pregnancy, what part of the brains, the brain is that affected? And do, through growing up, the children's brain develop that they can overcome, you know, the problems that they faced in utero and at birth? Great. The answer is which part of the brain? Every single part of the brain. The two that are probably most affected is the frontal cortex, where remarkably, prenatal substance abuse exposure, you were born there with neurons whose chromosomes are already prematurely aged. And what that sets you up for is a prefrontal cortex that isn't going to be quite as good in adulthood and making you do the harder thing when the right thing to do. The other area that is most affected is that dopamine system. And you downregulate the dopamine expression in that system forever after. What's that a profile of? You are prone towards addiction. You need a bigger oomph of addictive stuff to get the same release of dopamine. You are now set up for repeating the same pattern. In terms of interventions, what you see is one of the truisms of all of this stuff with epigenetics. Yes, epigenetic effects can be lifelong, they could be multi-generational. Nonetheless, every single one of them is potentially reversible. Things change, nervous systems change, but the rule of thumb is the longer you wait, the more of an uphill battle it's going to be. Sure. Next question is way up in the back here. Okay, I Hi. can't see um, anyone. You had that great slide with the uh, three different types of like uh, economy. So the, the rainforest, uh, the kind of the hunter-gatherer, and the... Agriculturalists. Uh, agriculturalists. And pastoralists. Yeah, so I wonder what behaviors do, does today's society uh, give rise to? So working in a corporation. <laughs> okay, um... I think I'm wisely not going to go near that one with a 10-foot pole, but there is one realm of contemporary American life where this is very pertinent, which is, historically, the original colonies were settled by people from different parts of the British Isles. And the New England tend to have Puritans, the Middle States had mercantile, sort of London-type folks, Quakers and all of that. The American South was predominantly settled by herders, herders, shepherds from Northern England, Scotland, Ireland, people who brought a culture of honor to the American South. And there is a whole universe of Southern studies now built around what Southern culture of honor is about. And it is the direct descendant of that. You see highest murder rates in the country in the American South, not in the cities, 
not by non-whites, not over material gains. This is not somebody sticking up a 7-Eleven. What this is, is people killing somebody they know, often a relative, at some get-together where they take a front at some honorific slight. And that's what demographically accounts for the higher murder rate throughout the South. Not only that, if you go and you kill somebody who, say, came on to your significant other, so you taught him a good lesson, you were most likely to be acquitted by a jury in the South. You were least likely to be prosecuted by a DA in the South. If convicted, you were likely to get the shortest jail sentence. And what you see there is 400 years after, like Scottish shepherds settled like the hill country in the South, there's still an imprint of that centuries later. And people actually do studies showing different endocrine responses to slights, personal affronts between Southerners and Northerners in this country. Classic studies like that, that's a realm in which all of this, what were your ancestors doing for a living, is remarkably still going on in the present. One additional realm of that, where cultures of honor impede on Western European and American life is the importation of one type of culture of honor that has honor killings killings of daughters, killings of younger sisters who refuse to marry the person chosen for them when they're 13, who have the affront to want to go to college, who want to have a job, who talk to a boy, and the relatives get together and kill that girl. And this has occurred in every Western European country, in the United States, in Canada, of immigrants from Pakistan and related countries that bring cultures of honor, that have honor killings, that is very much a part of our present landscape. So what they were doing back when is still very relevant now. Thank you. Next question on your left. Hi. Hi. Um, I understand it's complicated. I'd just like to know if your work has made you more or less optimistic or pessimistic about the trajectory of humankind. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I am by nature immensely pessimistic. And nonetheless, like reading this stuff, like I had to have read about like, I, I spent like six months just reading everything I could find about the Christmas truce in the trenches and amazing things Nelson Mandela did with rugby teams and all of that, because it's so damn curative after reading about the rest of stuff. Amid all of that, one has to admit, this is a much better world to live in than 200 years ago. And all sorts of things are in place that were unheard of then. And we extend sort of an umbrella of protection and a recognition of kinship and empathy in directions nobody ever dreamed of in the past. You know, against my better nature, I'm forced to be optimistic. The next question is right in the front. Hi, so I love the note of change and the optimism around that. But I guess what I grapple with still is that our ability to change isn't necessarily under our control. And I wonder how you personally reconcile that and how we can retain that optimism even knowing that so little of our life is under our control or our ability to change is under our control. Great, okay, I will take the liberty of reinterpreting you as just having asked about God help us all free will. <laughs> okay, so free will. Um, that one, I thought the optimism pessimism one was hard. So free will, um, what I think is pretty much impossible is to learn about all this stuff, all of these influences, all of these stories where the punchline is, whoa, I had no idea biology had something to do with that. I had no idea that could be influenced by over and over, and I think coming out the other end, I think at the end of it, it is very difficult to hold on to a concept of free will. If I'm being you know, congenial and a good house guest or whatever, I will say, if there's some free will, it's in all sorts of really boring places and it's getting crammed and tighter and tighter. If you want to say it's free will why you decided to floss your bottom teeth this morning first instead of your top first, I gesund, be happy, you know, good luck with that, free will. Personally, I don't think there's a shred of free will out there. I think it is completely incompatible with modern science. To my mind, free will is what we call the biology that has not yet been discovered. So 
that's cool and that's interesting. And so, okay, no free will and all of that. And at the same time that I am so comfortably assured that there's no free will whatsoever, I have the remotest idea how we're all supposed to live in a world in which people didn't think there was such a thing as free will. I have no idea at all. What I'm convinced of by now is it's going to be much, much easier to get people to think there's no free will when thinking about, say, a mass murderer. It's much harder to think about, oh, there's no free will involved if somebody comes up and says to you, oh, that was a good lecture afterward. <laughs> it was my genes and culture and evolution and fetal life and all of that. We're going to have so much harder a time of giving up the notion of free will built around our best behaviors, I think much harder than them and their worst behaviors. So within this framework of not believing in free will, how does anything change? The fact that the knowledge, for example, that change can occur leaves a biological trace in your brain. The knowledge that this has happened before, that somebody no more special than you in a moment like that has turned out to be magnificent, has taken three and a half neurons there in your frontal cortex and nudged him in a direction of thinking it's more conceivable that you would do something like that on the next occasion. Not because of free will, but because the knowledge that that could happen, the knowledge that the world is a better place than 300 years ago, the knowledge that just because you're male and you're soaked in testosterone, that's not inevitable just because of your genetics. There's no... Knowledge leaves a biological trace, just as every other bit of experience does. And what the right type of knowledge does is bias us in directions of feeling a sense of efficacy and actually trying to do something in circumstances where we would have thought it inconceivable otherwise. So the lack of free will and the fact that change can occur is compatible, but within this biological framework. We've got time for two more questions. Just a reminder to everybody, we're gonna be going to the atrium afterwards and Robert's gonna be signing books, so stick around for that. The next question's over here. Okay. Uh, what factors in human behavior do you see that lead to the regression of morality in society in very quick spurts? For example, in this Trumpian era, we see the open acceptance of racism. Um, I think what it is, don't get me started on him, but I think what it is is we have leadership, him, and his buddies, we have leadership that is unafraid of being openly venal, of being openly remorseless, of being openly incapable of empathy, that has a brilliant instinct for identifying the weakest underdog and scapegoating them, that has a brilliant ability to tap into people's angers and fears and anxieties and inflate them in the most toxic sorts of ways. We got somebody with a real gift at it and a bunch of willing, droid Republicans who are willing to enable him to do that. And what he has done is glorify the worst instincts of our most afraid, most disenfranchised people in this country. And it is not by surprise who voted him into office. And these are people who have been peripheralized and left behind and made culturally irrelevant and economically irrelevant. And he turned out to find out a perfect solution for that, which is to be pissed at hell at all of the easiest scapegoats you can find. And he's riding that very effectively with an intuition that far outstrips his intelligence. <laughs> Wait, last question. Did I say don't get me started about him? <laughs> Hi, I'm a student at UCSF, and I'm studying how stress impacts birth outcomes. I'm looking at stress both from self-report, just a general perception, and cortisol. Is there something else you think that may be meaningful in that relationship around stress that... Okay, for those of you who are not stress aficionados, what's, what's been brought up is the most wonderful, bestest hormone on earth, which is central to the stress response, which is what I've studied, something called cortisol, also known as hydrocortisone. It's of a class of st stress hormones called glucocorticoids. And if you can only measure one thing and you can't measure it within fractions of seconds of the event occurring, 
cortisol is the best one out there. It's the most integrative measure. Epinephrine, adrenaline is telling you about what the last two and a half seconds of stress have been like. Cortisol, what resting cortisol levels are like, what levels are like after the end of a stressful event, how long it takes you to get back to baseline. Those are the best measures as to what your recent weeks to months have been like. That's the most accurate measure out there. And best of all these days, you don't have to get somebody's urine or puncture their blood vessels. You get a salivary sample and it tells you a ton. So that's a great integrative measure of chronic stress. I have to Thank take you. this one last question. I'm really sorry, but I see a hand up here. Oh. Why is half of the body um, green and half of it red? <laughs> <laughs> well. Hey, it's not free will. <laughs> it's not free will. Um, what it is is a publisher's contract because the answer is, I don't know. This is the cover they came up with and I figured I should be agreeable because they were deciding how many copies to print and somebody at a publishing house in New York likes green and red and maybe they like Christmas or maybe they like people who have measles in two different colors at once, but that's what they came up with and I haven't figured out a good way of explaining why it makes sense. But I kind of like it, but wonderful question. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you all. Robert Sapolsky.